the ending of the book of Habakkuk shows that praise is the final step of enjoying something. C.S. Lewis said about joy that you haven't fully enjoyed anything until you've told someone about it. That's the final step. After you've found the grapes that you couldn't find anywhere else, your joy isn't complete until you've told us about it. And Habakkuk is about the righteous living by faith in God, while the wicked won't believe what God is doing. But Habakkuk is not over until he has sung God's praises for others to hear. Habakkuk is an oracle and a song. The oracle part is a burden. It's something heavy weighing on Habakkuk. Habakkuk's first complaint is that his own country, Judah, needs to be judged. And God's first answer was, you're not going to believe this, but Babylon is going to judge Judah. And God was right. Habakkuk did not believe that. And that leads to Habakkuk's second complaint. But Babylon needs to be judged worse than us. And God's second answer is, have faith. Babylon will be judged too. And now Habakkuk responds with a psalm of prayer and praise, reflecting on all the good things God has done for him in both creation and salvation, especially focusing on the history of the Exodus. Well, think about why it is that the Exodus is where his mind turned when he says, we're in trouble. Can God save us? I need reassurance. And he remembers the Exodus story. Now, this is a song also. Um, do you know that when King Joash, King Hezekiah, and King Josiah restored worship, there were major reformations under those three kings of Judah. And when they restored worship. They also restored singing in the temple back to the way it was under David and Solomon. And likewise, after the exile was over, Ezra and Nehemiah restored singing during their reforms too. And do you know that the Protestant Reformation not only restored the Bible to the people, but singing also? You ever heard the song, a mighty fortress is our God? That's Martin Luther. He wrote a lot of hymns during that time period and encouraged others to do the same. And songs are found throughout the Bible, actually outside of the book of Psalms too. Did you know that uh, Miriam has a song in Exodus 15? Deborah has a song in Judges 5? Lamentations is a whole book of the Bible that's a song. But songs or psalms are actually found in the New Testament too. Think of the three songs, Mary's song, Zechariah's song, Simeon's song. Revelation has a lot of songs in it also. But you know what? Habakkuk 3 is almost literally a psalm that's out of place in the Bible. Look at this in Habakkuk 3. Here's the start and finish of Habakkuk's psalm. It starts out, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on Shigioneth. Then there's three selahs in the middle, or selahs in the middle. We'll talk about what those are in a minute. And then it concludes with, for the director of music on my stringed instruments, which is found in the headings of some psalms. In fact, this line, a prayer of so-and-so, is found in the headings of five different psalms. For the director of music is found in 55 of the psalms. One third of all psalms contain that note. On stringed instruments is found in uh, another uh, seven psalms. And then this line, on Shigioneth, or a Shagion, is only found in two places in the whole Bible. It's in Psalm 7 and here in Habakkuk. And if we only knew what that meant, that would be really interesting. But these are the only two of this kind of psalm, and we don't know what that means. It's probably a musical term related to the type of song, either meaning the style or the content. Um, a shigu in Babylonian language is a song. And um, this could refer to a kind of meditative psalm, a lament psalm, or even a the style of music, a reel, some people uh, have suggested. It also could be referring to the content. This is a reflection on mistakes or for ignorance, or reflecting on errors, 
or being wandering and mournful, deceptive, maybe even musically deceptive. Maybe this whole song is meant to be sung in falsetto. We don't know. These selahs that are found here are found in 40 different psalms, but the only other spot in the Bible they're found outside of psalms is here in Habakkuk 3. And this probably means a rest in a psalm. It's a spot to pause for reflection. And I have to admit that the placements of the selahs in Habakkuk 3 are hard for me to understand where they're put. They appear to come in the middle of thoughts, and, and two of the three of them actually come in the middle of verses, which means that the people who put the notes in where the verses go also struggled with, like I do, with understanding why the selahs came in the middle of a thought, and they just skipped them and put the, the verse break at the end after it. The simple thing is, I'm going to read this psalm to you and stop at all the selahs. But when we get back, I'm going to circle back and reread a little bit part of it before it so that it flows that each section. All right, here is this psalm. Habakkuk's psalm. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. Selah. Then you pause there, okay? Do you see this reflection on history? Renew your deeds in our day. In our time, make them known. You ever read the Bible and you want to ask God for that? That thing you did back then, please do again. And reflecting on God's actions in saving Israel in the past is what's helping Habakkuk trust God in the future. Now, there's some geography coming up here. Teman is in Edomite territory. Mount Paran or Mount Sinai is probably the same mountain. And God's actions to the south of Israel as they came out of Egypt in the Exodus help Habakkuk to trust God in bringing Israel out of Babylon after the exile. You see, Edom was to the south of Israel, and they were famous for mountains, including Mount Seir. It's interesting that Job concludes the same way that Habakkuk is here. I had heard about you, but now I've seen you. And Teman is in Edom, who was a descendant of Esau, and Paran is connected to Edom and Mount Seir. And Job was from Uz, which became Edomite territory. This is another connection between Habakkuk and Job. But I think the main connection is to Moses. He says, in wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk throughout the book has been asking for God's justice. He wants God's wrath to come first on his own country and then on Babylon. But this time he's saying, God, I want your mercy in the middle of all of this. And this sounds like how Moses prayed for Israel. Remember, Moses prayed for God to forgive Israel the two major times they sinned at Mount Sinai when they made a golden calf and God said, I'm just going to destroy them all. And Moses stood and prayed and said, please don't. Please forgive them. And God did. Do you know where the other spot was? It's when they were about to cross into the promised land and they said, no, we won't go. And God again said, all right, then I'm just going to wipe them out. And Moses said, no, you, you said you'd forgive us. Please forgive them this time too. You know where those two places were? Mount Sinai and the desert of Paran. He's reflecting on those places right here as he's praying for God to remember mercy. You know, another connection to Job. Job wished he had a mediator like this. And we have a mediator like this. Jesus is our mediator who prays for us. And for Jesus' sake, God remembers mercy in the midst of his wrath. In Jesus, you are forgiven. You are given mercy. All your sin is forgiven and God's wrath passes over you, not because you are good, but because Jesus is and he's mediating for us. Now, Perrin is both the name of a mountain and a desert. Mount Paran, again, is probably Mount Sinai, the first place that Israel rebelled. And the desert of Paran is that place where Israel was camped when they sent their spies into Canaan and came back, the second place Israel rebelled. But they're back in Paran, the place where Moses preached his last sermon before he died. They're about to cross 
the Jordan back in, and that's still part of the deserts of Paran there. Now, in these final sermons, you know what we call these final sermons that Moses preached? It's the book of Deuteronomy. And in these sermons, Moses reviewed the story of God's salvation in the Exodus. And last summer, we saw that some of the geography of the Exodus is debated. But the geography here in Habakkuk 3 works to point south no matter which one of these options for uh, the geography is correct. Now, I don't know how well you know this, but you can see the Sinai Peninsula on that map there. On one side is the Suez, the Gulf of Suez, and the other side is the Gulf of Aqaba. There's a disagreement about which one of those is the Red Sea and which one of those mountains is Mount Sinai. One is called Jabal Musa, which means the mountain of Moses. Sounds like people named it that, believing that was Mount Sinai. But the other one is called Jabal al-Laws, the mountain of the law. Sounds like those people also believed that that was Mount Sinai. We don't know for sure which one it was. But you see that where Moses is standing, looking south, you can see over several sets of mountain ranges. You can see the mountains of Seir in Edom, down to Mount Sinai below it. And here's what he is saying. He's saying that God is going to come over those mountains to save them, like the sun rising. The sun doesn't rise from the south, sorry. But just imagine the sun rising over these mountains, coming this way up. In these Old Testament songs, there are multiple times where God is described coming over Mount Sinai or Mount Paran, then over Mount Seir, like the sunrise, as he's coming in to save them during the Exodus. And these songs also mention the crossing of the Red Sea and the Jordan right immediately following. So imagine God coming to save Israel, coming over these mountains like the sun rising, crossing the river. And here we get, listen to Habakkuk 3 in the context of these other Psalms. I'm going to read you three other passages first and hear the way that this is the same in all of them. Here's Deuteronomy 33, Moses' final blessing, where he's standing in the desert of Paran. This is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, announced on the Israelites before his death. He said, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Mount Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came with myriads of holy ones from the south, from his mountain slopes. In Judges 5, it's Deborah's song. On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang this song, O Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom, the earth shook and the heavens poured, the clouds poured down water, the mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai, before the Lord, the God of Israel. But may they, those who love you, be like the sun when it rises in his strength. Hear the mountains and the sunrise there. And here we have Psalm 77, a psalm of Asaph, which is reflecting on the Exodus. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The skies resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. Okay? Now here, Habakkuk 3, in the context of those psalms. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plagues went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled. The age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Cushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? You uncovered your bow and called for many arrows. Selah. Doesn't that sound similar to those other songs describing the Exodus? And we see God's glory there appearing from Mount, from Teman, Paran, and Sinai, like the sunrise. God's glory was seen on Mount Sinai and the pillar of cloud that traveled with Israel. 
God's glory was seen in the tabernacle and the temple. But you know what? It was also seen in the whole earth, which is also described as God's temple. God's glory was also shown in the plagues that he brought on Egypt and how he destroyed their enemies in the Red Sea. And God shook the earth at Mount Sinai too for both Moses and Elijah when he went back to, to visit. There was an earthquake there. And God also shook the earth when he appeared to Job. This is a picture of God coming. Can you imagine God coming and just the whole world around him is just shaking and it's so bright you can barely look at it. This is what it was like to see God at work there. But you know what? God's glory is also seen in Jesus. They saw Jesus' glory on a mountain at man, uh, of transfiguration. But you know what? God's glory is also seen in calm and peaceful ways. Do you know liturgically, Habakkuk 3 is read at Christmas. Jesus arriving in his glory is a picture there. St. Augustine said that this passage in Habakkuk 3 clearly refers to Jesus coming. Jesus coming in glory. And we sing it in joy to the world that he is, how do we sing that? Risen with healing in his wings. Imagine Jesus coming back. I mean, doesn't your, your picture of Jesus' final return include something that looks like the sunrise coming? Jesus coming back bright and shining, like, like going from the darkness to the dawn. Okay? So that's where Habakkuk is at, and his psalm continues. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. The sun and moon stood, stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath, you strode through the earth. In anger, you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people. You saved your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. Selah. Do you hear parts of Genesis here? The elements of creation that were undone by the flood, the mountains and the waters being ripped apart. Do you hear the elements of the Exodus here? The conquest of the land. God splitting first the the Red Sea, and then splitting the Jordan? Did you hear the story of the sun and the moon standing still as God did for Joshua? Do you hear the lightning that was visible at Mount Sinai? And do you hear how God crushed their leader as God crushed Pharaoh? You hear about the rivers and the seas which formed the border of Israel, the Euphrates, the Nile, the Jordan, the Red Sea, and the Mediterranean. Israel is surrounded by water in the form of rivers and seas. Do you know, this is another callback to Job, where God made his presence known. When God showed up, the first sign of God's arrival was the lightning. Again, do you, do you feel this picture of God arriving, and it's just with all of the majesty that we can imagine. But now he talks about his anointed one. That's the word in English. In Hebrew, the word is Messiah. When this is translated to Greek, it is the Christ. This is the coming king in the line of David. If you look for the word the anointed one or your anointed or his anointed, the noun form of anointed, in English in the Old Testament, you find 15 times that it's used. There are 128 times when it's used if you include the verb forms. In the Hebrew version of the Old Testament, if you look up this word Messiah, you find it 39 times. And when this was translated into Greek in the Septuagint, it was translated as Christ, and it's there 48 times. Our English Old Testament doesn't use the word Messiah or Christ in any modern Bible translation, which is unfortunate. But it's the word anointed one. That's what Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, means. Okay, in the Old Testament, the anointed one referred to priests in Leviticus, kings in 1 and 2 Samuel, prophets in 1 Chronicles, David in the Psalms. It even refers to Cyrus in Isaiah. 
It refers to the descendants of David in Lamentations, Daniel, Psalms, and 2 Chronicles. But the question is, what does it refer to here? Who's the anointed one? Is he, is he saying that Moses or maybe Joshua, the leader of God's people, was the anointed one? Is he saying that all of God's people was the anointed one? Is he mixing in the story of David and Solomon into this? Ultimately, what this is referring forward to is Jesus, Christ, our Messiah, the anointed one. Remember, Habakkuk is, is doing this interesting thing where he's looking back and forward at the same time. He's saying God saved his people in the Exodus so we can trust he'll save us after the exile. Jesus came in the time after the exile. This is this this transition here. If you look up Jesus' name or title of the Christ, the Anointed One, it's found 529 times in the New Testament. He's come. The Messiah has come. The Anointed One has come. This is the claim of the whole New Testament is that this one has come. Habakkuk's Habakkuk's hope in God is that God will save his anointed one and deliver his people. And that's the message of the New Testament, that God raised Jesus from the dead and that Jesus rescues us from God's wrath. In Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, you are saved from sin and death and delivered from the devil, our greatest enemy. Your sin is forgiven and God's wrath is removed from you. What Habakkuk saw has come true. And Habakkuk's psalm concludes this way. He says, you crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. Selah. With his own spear, you pierced his head. When his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who are in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, And the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and enables me to go on the heights. I like this picture of God piercing his enemy's head with his own spear. During the Exodus, the Amorites and the kings of Bashan were killed, the people were killed with spears. And David killed Goliath with his own sword. He, he hit him in the head with the uh, stone and killed him, but he also took his own sword out and chopped his head off with it. Benaiah, one of David's mighty men, killed an Egyptian with his own spear. And that might be the referent here, because we're talking about Egypt. Can you think about how the 10 plagues on Egypt were attacks on the specific gods of Egypt as though God was turning Pharaoh's own weapons against him? He starts by killing the Nile. They trusted the Nile as a god, and the first thing God does is just turns the Nile to blood. He's like, I just killed your god. There you go. And God judged this way where he takes something out of their hands and then gets them with it. I think also of this picture of, remember, Habakkuk asked for Judah to be judged by God. And God says he'll do it with Babylon. And he says, no. And then God's like, don't worry, I'm going to turn this spear of Babylon on Babylon itself. Another empire is going to destroy Babylon the same way. We have another reference here to God trampling on the sea, probably reminding us of the Red Sea crossing. We also see that Habakkuk is looking forward to the day of calamity. Isn't that a weird thing? I'm going to wait patiently for the day of calamity because it's coming on the nation that's invading us. He's waiting for the day of God's judgment to come on Babylon. Habakkuk is waiting for Babylon to be judged and Israel to be saved. And he concludes by saying that God's going to give him the feet of a deer so he can walk on the heights. Again, we we think of mountains as beautiful places, and they are. But this is a place of danger. And he's being given the equipment to 
go mountain climbing because he's going to have to hide out in the mountains like David hid out in the mountains from Saul. He's, he's, this is like another name for the wilderness where they are. In fact, during the time of the wilderness, God talks about carrying them on wings of an eagle on the heights. He's protecting them in the wilderness. Makes you think differently about our church name, doesn't it? New Heights. You ever think of that and go, wow, we're in new heights right now. We're in the middle of a new wilderness. We're in the middle of a new time of, of, of trouble. We're in the time when we need the feet of a deer. And we can trust that God will, will care for us through whatever new heights he puts us through. I don't think that's what we meant when we named the church that way. But it's a good reminder. Though there are no figs, no grapes, no olives, no other crops, no sheep, no cattle, yet I will rejoice in God, which sounds like Job's final line, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Here's the question. Can we honestly say amen to Habakkuk's ending? That would be a sign of faith. Can we rejoice in hard times? And the answer is that we can only rejoice in the Lord always, including singing in jail, as Paul and Silas did in Philippians, when we trust that God works all things together for our good. But that's what God does. In Jesus, we are saved. God is our Savior, and we can rejoice in him regardless of what's going on because he has forgiven our sin. We can look forward to the day of calamity. We can look forward to the day when every person on earth will get what they deserve for their sin, including us. That should be the scariest day there is. But we can look forward to that saying, I trust in God, my Savior, to get me through that day. Jesus, the anointed one. Okay, here's how Habakkuk 3 works as a psalm of praise to God, our Savior, that points us to Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one. It starts with a transition from hearing about God to seeing God like Job had. Next is a prayer of mediation for mercy and wrath, like Moses prayed for Israel on Mount Sinai and in the desert of Paran. Then it reviews God's work of salvation in the Exodus to give us hope of God's salvation for us. God comes from Mount Sinai, Paran, over Mount Seir, like the sunrise coming into the darkness to save Israel. He parts the seas. He shakes the earth. He controls the sun and the moon. He conquers the army by taking away its own weapon and using it against them. And he does this all to save his anointed one and deliver his people. And finally, Habakkuk looks ahead to the day of the Lord's calamity on the invading nation. Until then, he expects that we will be in the wilderness, on the heights, in the midst of famine, but God will save us. And we don't just wait for God's judgment and salvation. We rejoice while we wait for it in faith. Now, there's one more final connection from Habakkuk 3 to another song in the Bible that I don't think we should miss, and that's in Luke chapter 1. Zechariah sang this song to John the Baptist about the Lord Jesus Christ coming to save us. Listen for how Jesus is like the sun rising in the darkness, saving us by bringing God's forgiveness and mercy and keeping our feet on the path of peace even in hard places. Listen for these echoes of Habakkuk. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in the darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet in the path of peace. You hear that? You hear our, our feet able to walk? Habakkuk's song gives us the same knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of our sins. The righteous live by faith, but the wicked won't believe. God has heard the prayer of our mediator. 
Jesus, his anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah. God saved Jesus by rising him from the dead, and Jesus saves us from God's wrath. Here is the good news of Habakkuk and of all of Scripture. In Jesus, you are forgiven of your sin because of God's tender mercy. And Habakkuk is asking us to do two things with this fact. First, believe it. And second, rejoice in it. In Jesus, you are forgiven 